members may have your attention please uh, we are going to start second technical session and for taken te second technical session we have with us cs manvinder singh may i request manvinder sir please grace the grace the dais sir please uh, now uh, may i request cs ruchika gupta company secretary from ck billa group please come and present a floor bouquet to manvinder sir and welcome him at this occasion uh, madam please sir please grace the dais sir please thank you ruchika ji uh, we welcome you sir once again uh, for second sec second technical session we have two speaker cs manvinder manvinder singh sir and cs sunil jain sir so we are going to we, we, sir, we are going to start the session and the topic is on issues of various instruments under fdi to non residents i would like to take this opportunity to brief the profile of our guest speaker cs manvinder singh sir he he is member of the, he is fellow member of institute of company secretaries of india and he has and he has worked as a manager legal of an upstream oil and gas company sir has thereafter worked with some of the leading law firms including amarchandas and mangaldas and suresh a sroff and company and luthra and luthra law offices he is presently working with j sagar associates a leading law firm of the country sir has practice covers diverse areas of corporate and commercial law including foreign investment joint venture private equity and matters involving asset purchase business transfer he has advised a number of indian and foreign companies in structuring the acquisition or investment and rendered advice on corporate restructuring manvinder has also worked on matters involving fccb issues and ipo he has written several articles namely taxation of foreign companies for a journal of law asia and chapter on taxation of subsidiary company hp for a book publication of international physical association may I request member please a big round of hand to manvinder sir please uh, now i request our guest speaker please proceed with the meeting sir please thank you and welcome back i think uh, he's read a very old profile so it doesn't matter uh, <laughs> I don't even know where, you, where did you get it actually from. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So I actually uh, started my career with the uh, with the company as company secretary, manager legal. But thereafter, I sort of ventured into consultancy, became a lawyer, uh, and then then you know after that, been working only with the law firms. Uh, so my practice area is actually uh, it revolves around. Uh, uh you know doing transactional work uh, be it private equity investments advising on private equity investments strategic transactions and you know uh, mergers acquisitions etc because there are a lot of uh, non residents so we keep dabbling in fema quite often so anyway so i uh, i i i will just cover uh, you know one aspect of the you know uh, uh, fdi which is uh, you know foreign investment to india um yeah, this is visible right i yeah okay um so uh, if somebody wants to make a foreign investment to india there are various modes of making the investment uh, you could you could do it through a company whether it's a wholly owned uh, subsidiary or a joint venture company uh, or you could open a project office branch office liaison office there's there are other forms of uh, you know uh, uh, doing the, there are other forms of uh, you know uh, entities are also available be it in the form of llp uh, uh, partnership firms and uh, you know trusts etc as well mm -hmm. so how, how how many of you are actually comfortable or you know fema or you know you're mostly dealing with companies act you're comfortable with fema as such yeah mm -hmm. excellent so um, so in a company obviously the foreign investment is permitted uh, in project branch and liaison office there is no sort of investment you open office uh, there are guidelines around opening an office in india uh, as far as project and liaison office is concerned so under automatic rule for branch office you need rbi approval uh, llp uh, now it's permitted to invest through an LL into an llp as well uh, uh, basically there are some criteria as the llp should be under the auto i will come to that uh, you know what are the sectors under which automatic investment is allowed you know what under government route etc 
But basically, in LLP, one can do the business if uh, the trans if the LLP is engaged in a business which is under automatic sector, and there are no conditionalities, you know, with respect to minimum capitalization, or there are no performance conditionalities. Proprietorship, partnership, etc. You know, there's no foreign investment which can happen into a partnership or proprietary, except by a non-resident individual, non-resident Indians. Um, trust, there is, uh, there, there largely there's no foreign investment permitted in, in trust, except, uh, you know, there are some trusts which could be formed as FVC, foreign venture capital, or uh, FIIs if they are. If those investments are routed through a trust, only a specific kind of investment is permitted. Otherwise, largely trust, you can't invest into trust, through trust in India. So what are the instruments uh, uh, which are available for investment? Largely, I mean, I accept companies uh, in a uh, in a LLP partnership. I mean, it's partnership in any case is not permitted. In partnership, you can have a share in uh, the part. You can have a partnership in trust as well. Otherwise, in a company, there are you know various instruments which are available are equity shares, uh, preference shares, debentures, warrants, partly paid shares, FCCBs, ADRs, GDRs, etc. So equity shares, uh, I'm sure all of you are company secretaries. You you know you breathe in, breathe out shares. So you you're absolutely aware of equity shares. Uh, e equity shares could be fully paid up. They are, there are DVRs available as well. Uh, 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 you understand DVRs? Uh, differential, the, you know, equity shares with differential voting rights. So those could also be issued to a non-resident. Partly paid equity shares may be, can be issued now. It, uh, earlier there was a clear ban on issuance of partly paid equity shares to non-resident. Now it's permitted. Uh, but you can't issue partly paid preference shares or partly paid debentures to a non-resident. So equity shares partly paid can be issued. Again, preference shares, uh, uh, again, are of few types. Uh, preference shares could be uh, optionally convertible preference shares, fully convertible or compulsorily convertible preference shares. Uh, then the terms of preference shares could vary. But basically, it's only the compulsorily convertible or fully convertible preference shares which are, uh, which are permitted to be issued to non-residents. Same is the case with CCDs, uh, sorry, debentures. Only CCDs are permitted. Uh, OCDs being optionally convertible, uh, those cannot be issued to uh, the non-residents. Uh, warrants, you understand, uh, warrants basically give, give you, give, uh, give non-resident a right to invest in the equity shares of the company at some particular point in time. So warrants are permitted to be issued. Uh, there are, uh, I'll come to that, there are guidelines around it. Uh, you know, basically it's the same pricing formula and the time period within which they need to be fully paid, etc. Those guidelines have to be met, but otherwise warrants could be issued. <coughs> Partly paid, we've already talked about. FCCBs are, uh, these are basically, this is not a, I mean, technically, uh, because they, are, they could be potentially convertible into equity shares, so we've covered it as part of FDI, but otherwise it's basically a debt uh, you know, a debt which is taken by the company which is denominated in foreign currency with an option to convert it uh, at some point in time in, in, in equity shares. Uh, there are separate guidelines for issuance of FCCBs. Basically, only listed companies can do it. Same is with ADRs and GDRs, uh, you know, where uh, the sh shares of a listed company are given to a custodian and who in turn issue depository receipts or in simple, uh, you know, acknowledgements or receipts to the non-residents. So these are largely the instruments which are available. Uh, if at any point in time you want to interrupt and talk about something, you know, absolutely feel free to do it. I like it more, uh, you know, if it's interactive, I like it better. Uh, the various routes of investment uh, in India, uh, you know, now it's virtually everything is under automatic route. There are very few six or seven industries uh, where the you know either it's prohibited or the, you know you you need to go to a government for uh, seeking approval for investment. Uh, 
under the automatic route, you can issue you know whatever instruments that we just talked about. Those instruments could, could be issued. Uh, it you know those instruments can be issued uh, you know plainly without any uh, restrictions whatsoever, except one needs to uh, just follow the pricing guidelines. And uh, sometimes in some sectors like real estate, uh, multi-brand retail. Uh, uh, NBFCs, etc. There could be some capitalization requirements, the minimum lock-in, <coughs> depending on this, uh, depending on the quantum of in foreign investment, percentage of foreign investment, there could be minimum capitalization requirements. So, uh, so if, if, if those are there, then you just meet those requirements. There's no need to go to, a, uh, you know, uh, uh, RBI or uh, uh, earlier, you, there used to be FIPB. Now, FIPB no longer exists. So, there's no, so as long as it's under the automatic sector, you're meeting all of those conditions. You can, uh, one can issue shares, uh, issue shares or whatever other instruments. Uh, under the approval route, uh, earlier there used to be FIPB. Now, FIPB is abolished. Uh, you go to if you are, let's say, in defense sector, in print media. Uh, you know, there are some some sectors in which. Uh, you know, the uh, FDI is prohibited or is under the government route. So you, you go to government, you seek their approval. Now, the earlier it used to be FIPB who used to grant the approvals. Now it's the concerned ministry that grants the approval. Uh, you know, there's an online application which you file in, on the DIPP portal. They forward that application to the concerned ministry. The concerned ministry and, and you know, in fact, the concerned ministry and a lot of other departments as well. So the views of the concerned ministry, uh, concerned ministry takes the views of you know all the departments. Uh, look at uh, the you know look at the uh, proposal and you know approve or reject it. If they have to re reject the approval or put conditions which are over and above the conditions which are there in the FDI policy, for that uh, uh, you know the concerned ministry has actually take concurrence of DIPP. They can't just simply refuse on their own. They have to take concurrence of the DIPP. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, they, they, they can approve uh, on their own as well. So uh, if, the, if the project involves a FDI of more than 5,000 crores, uh, the concurrence of CCEA, Cap, uh, Cabinet Committee of Economic Affairs, you need the approval of uh, concurrence of that committee as well. Um, I think uh, approval we've actually talked about, uh, you know, the, the stages of approval basically uh, you, as far as you are concerned you have to only make an application through the portal uh, if we are digitally signing it there's no need to even give a signed copy of the application if you're not digitally signing it you send a send one copy to the concerned ministry uh, you know then uh, they internally dis, you know do it there are uh, you know there are some rules around uh, how to make a representation, how to seek a clarifications, et cetera. But I think those are fairly procedural. Um, as I said, uh, in, a, in a company which is under the automatic route, uh, where there is no government intervention is required, where you know, non-resident could simply come and you know, infuse capital in the company or infuse, uh, you know, acquire shares, the only thing that one needs to follow is just the pricing guidelines. Pricing guidelines are fairly simple. Uh, you need to go to the <coughs> chartered accountant uh, or SEBI, uh, uh, SEBI registered merchant banker who will, uh, who will value the company uh, based on any internationally acceptable pricing methodology on an arm's length basis and uh, whatever is the fair market value. If the company is issuing the shares or if the resident is transferring the shares, the fair market value, which is given by the uh, you know the chartered accountant or a SEBI registered merchant banker, acts as a floor price. It can, the price at which one can issue the shares to a non-resident cannot has to be always above the fair market value, which is given by the chartered accountant. Uh, if it's other way around, if it's uh, if it's there's a non-resident transferring the shares to a resident, then the same fair market value actually acts as a ceiling. Uh, a resident cannot pay more than the fair market value to a non-resident. So that's it, actually. You know, uh, in an automatic sector, you just need to follow the pricing guidelines. 
and there are you know some filing requirements which I'll just come to. There are no other conditionalities. Fairly simple, uh, you know, uh, uh, regime now. Um, there are a couple of exceptions with respect to even following the pricing guidelines. If uh, if the non-resident is, if it's the first time issuance in case of a new company, uh, the non-resident is acquiring the shares by subscribing to the memorandum of association. You don't even need the valuation certificate, as long as the company is issuing the shares at a fair market value. You know, uh, that's that's all that's required. Uh, also, in case of a rights issue, uh, technically the pricing guidelines actually do not apply. Uh, the only condition is as long as the, ish, the, sh the price at which you are issuing your shares to a non-resident should not be lower than the price at which you are issuing the shares to a resident. That's all. Uh, uh, and there are no pricing guidelines you don't need to. Although that's technically the case, I think RBI invariably comes up with the requirement to furnish a uh, you know, a, a valuation certificate. But as far as strict interpretation of law is concerned, I mean, in a rights issue, there's no need for even following the pricing guidelines. The only condition is that, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the price at which you are issuing the shares to a resident should not be higher. Um, then there could be convertible instruments. Uh, though the convertible instruments, uh, you know, we just talked about CCPS, CCDs. Those are convertible into equity shares and uh, debentures. So under those circumstances, the, uh, we still need to file the valuation certificate. That will be on an as-if converted basis, what would be the number of shares, and that, you know, the shares effectively at the price at which they are getting issued to a non-resident post-conversion, et cetera, should be above the fair market value. Um, and the formula uh, through which you are determining the, the price or the formula uh, through which you're determining the conversion, that needs to be determined upfront, upfront as in at the time of issuance. You can't change it later on, you can't, uh, you can't have a vague, for, or you can't, cannot have, not have the formula and you know, decide later on uh, after issuance the, the formula. <coughs> so, uh, the reporting requirements are again fairly simple. In case of a transfer of shares, you file form FCTRS within 60 days of the receipt of the consideration. The form FCTRS is always filed with, by a non-resident, uh, by a resident transferor or transferee, never the you know, non-resident transferee. And uh, in case of a listed company, uh, if there's a FDI happening, then, uh, uh, then the company actually files the uh, FCTRS form, otherwise it's always the transferee who files. If the company is issuing shares, uh, they have to file form FCGPR. FEMA requires that uh, uh, the allotment should be completed within 180 days of uh, the receipt of the consideration. Uh, that used to be the case, but now since the Companies Act actually uh, prescribes a lesser threshold of 60 days, so practically you'll have to issue shares within a period of 60 days, but FEMA allows 180 days to be issued, uh, for the shares to be issued, uh, you know, uh, and, and post, the comp uh, post the receipt of the consideration. So FCGPR needs to be filed within uh, 30 days. Uh, there are, you know, uh, we've already spoken about the valuation certificate which needs to be filed along with the FCGPR. Uh, there is a CS certificate as well. I'm sure a lot of practicing company secretaries would be doing that already. It basically talks about, uh, you know, the compliance with the Companies Act, the con whether the conditions which are, if any, if, you know, under the government approval route, those are, uh, you know, those have been adhered to, companies eligible to issue, et cetera. So that certificate has to be filed and uh, there's a form FIRC, uh, actually you get FIRC and there's the advanced reporting form as well for filing the, uh, you know, within 30 days of filing the remittance as well. So generally FCGPR, FIRC gets filed almost together. And then there is an annual return, which is there as part of FCGPR only, which has to be filed by the companies on an annual basis. So, so practically, uh, this is all that one needs to know with respect to issuance of shares for a company under automatic route. Uh, as I said, just follow the pricing guidelines, file these couple of forms, and there we are. I mean, all of you are company secretaries, so 60, section 62, 42 requirements with respect to uh, the companies, etc. I'm hoping you already know. So, you know, uh, while the law is so simple, 
Uh, I just thought, uh, let's look at it in the form of a little problem to say, uh, if there is a, if, if I pose a problem to you and say, there is this private company who wants to issue, who wants to raise capital from abroad, from a non-resident, uh, and it's a private equity investment. The, you, know, you understand private equity investment, do you? Yeah, you understand, why don't you tell me? So it's basically a, a, you know, a person who takes a minority interest, hopefully a minority interest, I mean, there's no law which doesn't allow them to uh, hold majority, but mostly uh, the transactions by a private equity in investor are minority because they don't control the management, they don't like to control the management. So, uh, so let's assume there's a private equity investor who wants to invest into a company, it's a minority investment, and uh, it's a Series B funding. You you understand Series. I mean, basically, typically, all of these companies these days, they come with Series A, B, C, D, which basically means nothing except that there's a round of investment, there's a second round of investment, there's a third round of investment, post the first round of investment. So, <clears throat> so and every series in which they sort of raise capital is called Series A, B, C, D, etc. So let's assume this is a Series B investment happening. Uh, non the 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 private equity player who's investing is uh, is obviously non resident uh, so what do you think the kind of instrument that a pe investor would actually like to uh, acquire in this company uh, any ideas see we we've talked about uh, you know all the all the various instruments that that are available right it basically if I were to actually make it real simple, there are only four choices, equity shares, preference shares, e equity shares, uh, which, are, which could be partly or fully paid up, uh, compulsorily convertible preference shares, compulsorily convertible debentures and warrants. So these are basically the four choices, right? So, uh, so, so what do you think, uh, why would uh, a private equity investor choose one instrument over the other and which one would you think would be a preferable instrument for a private equity investor? CCPS, excellent, why? Sorry? Preferential right with respect to uh, the dividend and the winding up, excellent. So good, uh, good, good. You know, I, I, I've always felt uh, uh, we're very sort of uh, uh, concerned about compliances and which filings, etc., to be made. So, but when it comes to actually implementing or looking at, uh, you know, uh, looking at a situation uh, and and you know, uh, which is the better course to take? I think, you know, we always have, you know, we always look for another professional. So, I think it's extremely important that we can sort of come out of just the filing. In fact, that was the main reason that I kept the boring path first. You know. This is what the law is, this is the pricing regulations, this is what the forms are. I deliberately, I haven't gone too much into law and, you know, I actually want to talk about uh, how you would deal with certain situations practically. I think uh, uh, if there's one thing which possibly, I mean, I'm part of the fraternity, so I can sort of speak freely on, on behalf of the fraternity to say, if there's one thing that we need to learn is we need to, you know, look at law and sort of start implementing it or start applying it to various situations. That's what we need to learn. And that's what I think I'm going to do it today. Yeah, so uh, so let's look at the choice of, uh, I think this slide I've already covered. These are the sort of four uh, choices. Uh, so let's look at why would a private equity choose one instrument or the other? What is, what is it that a private equity investor really wants? You already mentioned liquidation preference, that's my sort of first point. Uh, so basically, a PE investor is taking obviously a lot of risk when he's investing into a company. He is not a creditor, he is he got to take equity risk for sure, but even when he's taking the equity, equity risk, he definitely wants that his investment is actually at par, or not at par actually, it's, it's superior to uh, you know, the investment made by the founders or the promoters. So before the founders or the promoters get their money back, he should get the money back. Uh, so typically, uh, for primarily for this reason that, uh, you know, a, a PE investor actually goes for a C. So actually they're primarily, if you were to ask, there are two reasons, valuation adjustment and 
liquidation preference that, that uh, a PE investor goes for a, a CCPS or a CCD route. Uh, so, so he definitely wants that there should be a liquidation preference. Uh, now, liquidation preference is not just the liquidation preference the way uh, you know we have possibly read it in the companies act to say uh, a preference shareholder would uh, get a preference over the equity shares shareholders when it comes to winding up or at the time of dividend. In a in a situation where there are series of investor series A, B, C, D, etc., one can negotiate the liquidation preference. One can negotiate the liquidation preference to say the series D or the latest round would possibly carry the highest liquidation preference in terms of they will get paid first, then possibly series C, then B, A. These are all negotiable. So, uh, so you know, so, so private equity investor typically negotiate that, or it could still it could just be that all preference equity, you know, all equity investors who, in fact, the Series A investor actually took more risk when the company was not that developed. A company, a pre investor came and he actually took a lot more risk. So why should why should that investor be actually lower in the hierarchy in terms of getting the you know the capital back? So it all depends on negotiations, but all of those negotiations are possible. So, uh, so liquidation preferences, who gets paid in what sort of order of hierarchy amongst the shareholders, amongst the uh, equity shareholders or preference shareholders. Uh, so that's, that's foremost. And then, uh, uh, you know, the second most important reason pe uh, private equity investor actually goes for preference shares is the valuation adjustment. You understand uh, what I'm talking, uh, anybody you want to, uh, see, basically, uh, Private equity investor takes a lot of risk in terms of, uh, uh, you know, when they have invested into the company, he's obviously done his diligence. But, uh, but let's say there is, the company has not done too well tomorrow. Then typically the kind of, uh, and there is a down round. Uh, down round means uh, while in this series, I mean, Flipkart phased down round, a lot of uh, these startups phased down rounds recently. Uh, so uh, typically what happened, uh, down round means uh, you issued shares, let's say in series B at, at a price of 500, while in series C the price has actually come down and you're issuing the shares at 400 rupees per share. So, so if there's a down round, typically a PE investor says, uh, you know, adjust my, uh, so, so there are actually a full ratchet anti-dilution protection, uh, broad-based weighted anti-dilution anti protection, basically says, my price should also come down in a way that my price in a full ratchet should be equal to uh, the price at which you are issuing the shares now. In a broad based, you it won't come the same price, but you ba you basically calculate in a fashion that you take you look at the weighted average of the shares which are getting issued, uh, you know, in, in the down round, and the in the price at which you got issued uh, the, the shares, and then you calculate uh, weight you know, weighted price based on the uh, the number of shares in the down round, and then there's a formula which is linked to that. You come to basically a price which is lower than the original conversion formula. So, uh, so typically, if you have got the shares issued, which are which are not already equity, your stake is sort of not not frozen, not fixed, while you know. Uh, we, we actually call it fully diluted basis. So, so when you actually invested into the company, you, you calculated your shareholding on a fully diluted basis, which would come to a certain percentage. And it will be all based on a certain formula. The formula will take care of certain valuation rights as well. And based on that formula, if tomorrow you need to change the valuation, the formula, or the conversion uh, price, that so it, it would all be sort of filed with the RBI, it would all be, you know, documented uh, at the time of issuance. So this shouldn't be a, this, there's no problem, there's no sort of illegality there. So you need to uh, come up with a convert, so as long as you're doing it as per the formula, uh, all of these protections are permitted under FEMA or even uh, under the Companies Act. Section 62 also, there are rules around that. Uh, Section 62 also talks about in case there is a convertible instruments being issued, you need to give them the, actually, uh, Companies Act is slightly, if you read the strict language, Companies Act is actually slightly more restrictive now. But I think uh, people have taken a view that the position is not uh, worse than what is it from, you know, under the FEMA. So as long as a formula is being uh, determined upfront and 
you know, and the shares are getting issued as per the formula or getting converted as per the formula, it's perfectly as per law. Uh, so, uh, so typically a private equity investor, you know, loves to have those adjustments in case tomorrow, uh, you know, at, at times there are some events that the com company is imminently facing. So if, and uh, at the time of investment, it, it may not be clear what would be the result of those investments. So, so the valuation of the company sometimes largely depends on, let's say, whether the company is going to get a contract or not, whether there's a litigation which is going on in the company, whether it will be decided to or against the company, whether uh, 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 there could be various eventualities. So, so, so unless those, you know, and you don't want to wait for those eventualities to actually happen before the, there's an investment by private equity investor. So what do, what do they do? They, they say, okay, if, if, if you were to get a contract, I'm, I'm actually, uh, you know, investing based on the fact that you're going to get a contract. So the valuation would be certain and it will be certain higher amount. However, if you don't get it, then I'm going to discount that valuation to say your valuation is going to be less. So depending on those in eventualities, you can actually have a, have a formula, uh, you know, built in into your terms of investment and or terms of uh, issuance of CCPS and as and when those, uh, you know, eventualities actually come to fore, your, your stake would actually depend on that. Uh, uh, and it happens extreme, you know, very often, I mean, uh, in a in a certain situation, uh, you know, I, I we just actually closed a deal with respect to a renewable energy, wherein uh, uh, the valuation is actually based on a certain uh, capacity uh, of generation. If those capacity, if that capacity of generation is achieved by the company, there will be a certain valuation. If that capacity is not achieved, and whatever is the lower achievement, uh, you know, the valuation formula is actually getting adjusted with respect to each megawatt, you know, less being achieved by the company. So all of these things are actually, you know, gets built in into the terms of issuance. Um, then, uh, 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 you know, one of the other, uh, you know, rights which a private equity investor would, be, would like is that, uh, you know, they want to make sure that no other person comes with a superior right. So, uh, I mean, in, in equity shares, you know, you, you all become equity shareholders, you're all at par. In, in case of CCPS, you can have, uh, you know, certain grading in terms of, like we said, liquidation preference or, uh, you know, rights are not just about return and voting. It could actually be you're giving somebody better exit rights. You're giving somebody better uh, uh, liquidation preference. I think that we've talked about. So, you know, AVM's better uh, management rights. So. So all of those rights are actually, you know, an instrument doesn't mean just the instrument. It means uh, instrument plus rights and returns which are associated with this, right, returns, risk. Mm -hmm. So if they are giving somebody uh, else superior rights, then, then uh, you know, uh, one would like those rights to be there. Uh, dividend, uh, uh, right to receive dividend in preference over the other. That's another reason one would possibly, one would possibly look at while selecting an instrument. Dividend is actually not, generally we've seen uh, private equity investors are more concerned about the capital, uh, 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 you know, more concerned about the return, the capital along with the ret returns, uh, to those to be secured, I think. Uh, dividend, generally I haven't, see, I haven't seen uh, private equity investors being very concerned about dividend. And then uh, the voting rights and affirmative voting matters. So all of these factors, uh, uh, you know, go, are, a PE investor actually bears, takes into account of all of these factors. Now, if, if, if his main concern is, you know, control or voting, uh, then possibly he'll rather go for equity share, shares rather than, you know, CCPS. Although, technically, in case of a private, private company, uh, CCPS or preference shares with voting right is actually permitted because those sections do not actually apply to a private company. Uh, affirmative voting rights uh, is a matter which is closely linked with whether somebody has a control, what kind of affirmative matters, what kind of uh, matters specifically require an affirmative consent of the private equity investor when they are investing. So, so basically these are all of the concerns that a PE guy has and uh, mostly based on these concerns we have seen equity shares actually come very low in preference in terms of uh, 
when they are when they are acquiring a stake in the company. Equity shares only give a control. I mean, uh, uh, you know, only give control, and obviously, equity. It's not that equity share has no other benefit. I mean. Uh, there is a statutory right to receive a rights offer issue, issuance of the shares. There's a, in case the company goes for bonus, et cetera, there's a statutory right to receive those as well. Those are possible even in case of CCPS, et cetera, as well. Uh, just that one has to make sure that those are built into the terms. Uh, statutorily, uh, in terms of control and with, with respect to these rights, CCPS ranks slightly lower uh, compared to equity share. So uh, if, if the main concern of a private equity investor is control and voting, et cetera, he'll go for equity shares. If his concern is more, as we already discussed, liquidation preference, valuation adjustment, et cetera, he would possibly go for a CCPS. Um, so as I said, uh, the, you know, I, I just listed the pros and cons of uh, uh, equity shares, as I said. Control and uh, statutory right to receive bonus shares, etc., is are the you know the positive points about the equity shares. While the fact that it ranks lowest in terms of uh, you know receiving the money back, the principal back, uh, uh, that's a negative point. Uh, it doesn't give any special rights to any shareholder in terms of uh, dividend or winding up or uh, valuation adjustment, etc. So. Uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and we, we discussed it, it's a series B. So sometimes it so happens that you have your existing investor who's already sitting and who's holding superior instruments. I mean, superior instruments in the sense, uh, you know, which have better returns or, you know, in terms of liquidity, exit rights, et cetera. So under those circumstances, it may be better that you, you actually have the same instruments or the superior instrument what the, you know, existing investor has. Uh, so, uh, so equity shares, because of all of these reasons, uh, we haven't seen too many transactions where the transaction has actually happened, unless it's a buyout fund, unless it's a control fund which, who actually goes on to acquire, you know, possibly control at some point in time. They don't care about which instrument or which what return, etc., because they, it's it's them who's actually going to run the show. At you know, so under those circumstances, they will acquire equity. <coughs> Uh, I think uh, this slide we've actually uh, already covered. Um, so uh, the, the positive points about preference shares is you get a dividend, you get payment, you get preference in, uh, you know, with respect in case of winding up. Redeemable pref shares are not permitted, only compulsorily uh, uh, convertible preference shares are permitted. Uh, so the preference shares could actually be uh, Cumulate, uh, you know, the dividend on the preference shares could actually be cumulative or non-cumulative. Uh, sometimes, uh, 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 and you can build all of that in the terms of issuance as well. So sometimes these private equity investors, they only want return at the end of the, sort of their term or at the end of five years or when they have to actually give returns to their investors. So under those circumstances, uh, you know, uh, if, if it's a cumulative preference shares, you know, the, the, the dividend would continue to get accumulated and they'll get paid at the end of their term. And then, you know, they can give return to their investors. Uh, and yeah, I think valuation adjustment, we've already talked about. So because of all of these reasons, we've seen CCPS being a much favored instrument rather than, uh, you know, plain vanilla equity shares. There's a lot of uh, flexibility or creativity that you can have with respect to uh, the preference shares. Uh, the negative points about the Preference shares are, you know, uh, typically they don't carry voting rights, uh, especially in case of a public company. Yes, it is possible. Yes, it is possible. No, it's possible, not in case of a public company. Public company, you cannot issue. Not in case of a public company. In case of a private company, yes, you can. Yes. Yes, absolutely. You're right. Uh, yeah. So uh, OCPS do not come under the FDI policy. Uh, so I think uh, one point possibly I missed was with respect to the preference shares being participating and non-participating. I mean, uh, 
participating you understand i mean in terms of the winding up or you know in case in case of declaration of dividend if whatever is the coupon being fixed uh, whether they get to participate in the greater dividend or if the return is more whether they get to participate in the uh, at the time of winding up with respect to the greater returns as well uh, so uh, so these are some of the negative points about the preference shares uh, including the fact that uh, they 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 do not have a statutory right to receive uh, uh, rights issue offer or uh, the preference uh, or the bonus issue uh, you can build into the terms but they don't have a statutory right with respect to that so uh, but these are all you know one so one, you know one can actually possibly most of these points can actually be uh, addressed in the terms of issuance so because of all of these reasons preference shares actually rank way higher in, in terms of uh, you know the as a preferred instrument uh, let's talk about debentures now this again isn't very uh, popular or the main reason for uh, ccds not being very popular is uh, uh, a the companies act now requires that if the ccds are unsecured and if you are actually issuing the capital you would you would, you know you would always keep them unsecured in case of unsecured uh, ccds you have to convert them in within 5 years so so suddenly after 5 years you know your one is grappling with the new instrument when you know you, you suddenly have equity shares plain vanilla equity shares it may uh, it may be a great idea if you're only looking at a you know security only in the beginning and after a few years you are sort of okay with holding equity shares it may actually turn out well but otherwise uh, ccds do not have any uh, voting right um uh, there's no they don't get bonus shares they don't get right offer for rights issue uh ocds are not even permitted uh uh the debentures or the ccds you know uh, it shouldn't but uh, i think the banking community looks at them as if those are debt pure debt instruments and therefore uh, uh you know their the the debt equity ratio of the company or the liquid uh, you know the uh uh, the uh, the ability to leverage uh, uh, from the market that actually gets reduced so because of all of these reasons uh, you know ccds do not figure very high we haven't seen too many transactions in ccd but they do happen i mean uh, if if the main concern of the person is that if it's a highly risky uh, sort of uh, business they want to absolutely make sure that they are at a higher footing uh you know compared to other shareholders and possibly they are almost equivalent to creditors then they would like to have ccds um <coughs> there's a fixed rate of interest that one can build in into the ccds uh they you know they because they are convertible into equity shares at some point in time the valuation adjustment principles can be built into the terms of issuance and you know at least those protections associated with the valuation adjustment etc all of those can be built in uh so 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 they have some positives which we just talked about uh then warrants uh warrants uh, earlier they never even used to be allowed warrants are not even a sort of a it's just an entitlement to invest into the company this doesn't give you a immediate stake or immediate interest in the company as in when the shares actually get issued to you that you actually become owner uh, you know and and have the rights or uh, uh, you know uh, the, the benefit of the business or the risk associated with the business and the returns associated with the business you you only get once the shares are issued to you so it's not a very popular instrument i mean it's it's available for uh, for you know available to be issued to the non resident but basically uh, you know it's not even a it's not even a ownership uh, it doesn't even give you ownership so it's not a very popular instrument partly paid shares are now permitted uh, we've seen a few instances where people have gone for partly paid shares uh, basically not for the basically you just wanted to uh, uh, it's only under the circumstances that you want to uh, invest in tranches but you don't want the valuation to be you know adjusted every time that you are investing so it shouldn't be the case that uh, they are investing few uh, they are investing into shares today and few more shares six eight months down the line and the valuation is actually differential so it's only to take care of those aspects that uh, uh, you know one well, we've seen transactions happening just to uh, you know avoid those valuation aspects that you know one goes for partly paid otherwise it's not a very 
sort of again a very popular instrument to uh, go for by the private equity investors. Uh, the reporting and pricing regulations are largely the same. Uh, a minimum of 25% consideration, of the consideration has to be brought up front and remaining within a period of 12 months. If you don't, then uh, you know, these instruments are liable to be forfeited. <coughs> um, any questions so far? Um, I think... Uh, uh, you know, my next slide was actually on the ter typical terms of issuance of CCPS. I think largely we've already discussed. Uh, you know, one would, uh, you know, when we make an agreement for uh, investment, it's it's a basically, a, uh, uh, you know, an agreement which sometimes is more than 100 pages. Uh, the terms of issuance, uh, you know, runs into five, 10 pages. Uh, and you know all of those terms with respect to what happens if there is a split, what happens if there's a bonus issue, what happens if there is a valuation adjustment, what happens uh, you know if uh, if there's a down round. So all of those uh, you know eventualities are captured there. Uh, we've lately seen uh, RBI actually is getting a little proactive in terms of uh, what is precisely the conversion ratio, etc. They want to know. Uh, so, so because of all of that, uh, uh, you know, this, the terms are actually uh, devised very carefully these days. Um, so the terms typically include, uh, you know, uh, coupon, which is dividend, uh, 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 you know, whether it's cumulative, non-cumulative, participating, non-participating, you know, the terms of conversion, what happens in case of valuation adjustment, what happens in case there's a down round, what happens in case there's certain targets not met, what happens in case there is a litigation, which is, you know, so wherever the conversion formula has to be adjusted, all of these things are there in the, uh, you know, the terms of conversion. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, adjustments on account of split, subdivision, consolidation of equity shares. So what happens to the terms of conversion, all of that is addressed. The voting rights, the participation in the meetings, the voting rights, et cetera. Uh, the f uh, you know the typical MFN clauses, uh, the most favored clauses that if you end up issuing shares or uh, uh, instruments to somebody else with superior rights, then what happens to these instruments? Uh, they also uh, you know uh, typically uh, the existing investors uh, you know either seek a consent that you either take my consent or give me the same rights. All of those terms are mentioned in the terms of issuance. And uh, you know the liquidation preference, et cetera, as well. So all of these terms are there. It's a fairly sophisticated document. Uh, uh, same way with the terms of CCDs, uh, you know, conversion, adjustment, transfer, coupon rate, uh, you know, right to participate in meetings, AVMs. So all of those terms are generally mentioned in the terms of CCDs as well. Um, right. So, uh, so this was about uh, if there's a private equity investor who wanted to invest. Now in case uh, there's a strategic transaction happening who doesn't care about uh, you know, the valuation adjustment and if there's, let's assume there's a 100% transaction, uh, there's a foreign company acquiring an Indian company and it's a 100% acquisition. That person is not going to be bothered about his return after five years, I mean he's, is there in the company for the long haul, right? So under those circumstances, the you know typically what we've seen is uh, it's always the equity shares. Their concern would be whether he's paying the right price or or he's overpaying. Uh, so under those circumstances, we've typically seen uh, you know a lot of fight about indemnification, a lot of fight that is the there's a valuation gaps in terms of. Uh, 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 you know, uh, while the seller believes that the company is valued a certain, should be valued at a certain price and the buyer believes, well, you don't have those kind of margins, those kind of uh, top line, that kind of a beta, that I can't give you that kind of money. So, so sometimes what happens is fine. Uh, they say, let's see if you, if you achieve certain targets, if those eventualities are met, if there's no indemnification uh, event, if there is no loss or no, or if, if the buyer is reasonably comfortable after, uh, you know, in about, in about a year's time, then, then they would say, let me hold a certain part of consideration, I'll pay you, 
this, but only after one year. Or maybe sometimes it would just be, hey, hand me, handhold me for you know year, year and a half, and uh, I want to become reasonably comfortable with the business, and then I'll be happy paying you even extra price. So under those circumstances, you know they they defer the consideration. The co consideration actually gets deferred for uh, you know few months. So uh, earlier it always used to be. We actually used to call those as earn out structures. Earlier they they uh, you know it wasn't permitted, but uh, now uh, one can defer the consideration up to 25 percent of the consideration can be deferred uh, for about 18 months. Uh, 18 months gets calculated from the date you enter into the agreement and not from the date you, uh, you, you close the transaction, you pay up the money. Uh, however, if you are retaining in the form of indemnification, you've paid the full amount and there's an indemnification, then, then 18 months actually starts from the date of full payment. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, that's it, I mean, about uh, uh, the deferred consideration. Um, then there's one concept of downstream investment, um, wherein the, uh, see the FDI may happen directly from abroad or they, uh, or there could be an, there could be a company uh, floated by a non-resident in India who would invest into another company or, uh, so, so a downstream investment refers to when an Indian company, which is which is not Indian owned or controlled, is making an investment into another Indian company that's called downstream investment. And in a situation like that, uh, you know, the same uh, conditionalities, pricing guidelines, the sectoral uh, guidelines with respect to the maximum cap and shares, the same guidelines one need to follow. Uh, uh, so if, uh, the, the law is that if there's an Indian company which is foreign either owned or controlled, that company, if it invests into a, another Indian company, then whatever is the investment by that Indian company into another downstream entity, the whole of that investment is treated as a foreign investment. <laughs> However, if the Indian company is, so if the upper company is only 49% owned by the foreign investor and the, they don't exercise control, then whatever investment that Indian company has made into the downstream entity, the, that will not be treated as FDI. That will be treated as a, that, that's an Indian investment. Uh, the only, uh, I mean, owned and controlled aspects are generally easy. To, I mean, control is always a little bit of a ticklish point, but ownership aspect is generally very clear. Uh, control aspect is, you know, is, is slightly more difficult to determine uh, whether, uh, you know, an Indian entity is controlled, uh, even if not owned more than 50% by a foreign investor, whether they're still in a position to control the management, the policy decisions through shareholders' agreements. So that's always a subjective criteria. Uh, so assuming that is the case, that there is a company which is owned or controlled by a foreign investor, then the law says that uh, the funds for acquisition, fund for downstream acquisition has to come from abroad. The Indian company can't leverage the markets in India uh, to to make a downstream investment, and then there are you know these guidelines, uh, uh, their filing requirements and intimations, etc. Uh, you know to DIPPX. So uh, so this this actually sometimes becomes extremely difficult to determine whether. Uh, so I think I missed one point. So so either the fund needs to come from abroad or it should be from internal accruals. Uh, but you can't leverage the Indian market to uh, make a downstream investment. So sometimes it becomes very difficult if there's a lot of foreign investment which is there, there's an equivalent amount of loan, uh, the company is running into losses. So sometimes it becomes extremely difficult to determine whether, uh, you know, and the money is fungible, whether one, one should, uh, how, how should one determine whether uh, you know, it's from internal accruals or from, uh, you know, the, the funds which have been leveraged or is it from the money which has earlier come from abroad. So I think one, uh, uh, so under those circumstances, I mean, we have taken various views with respect to such a situation, but those are, you know, fairly uh, 
case specific, but in general, as long as there is no specific uh, leveraging of funds for the purpose of acquisition, we could be in the green as long as the other two factors are there. There's uh, enough headroom as far as the foreign funds are concerned and there are some internal accruals which are not, or if there are losses, those are not totally offset by the foreign investment. So one has to take a view whether this is otherwise, you know, the safer route would be to actually get the investment from abroad and uh, make the downstream investment. Um, some of the other aspects that one typically faces in a transactional scenario is, uh, you know, if there is, uh, I think the slide has come a little later, actually should have come first. Uh, the, uh, you know, if there's an existing investor and if that investor uh, uh, was holding, uh, let's say, preference shares or uh, some instruments, some, uh, some uh, you know, uh, uh, some class of shares, then in case that class, in case you are varying because of the new investment, if some, there's a variation of rights in, in you know, uh, of the existing shareholder, then you have to seek his consent, either seek his consent or pass a class resolution. Uh, otherwise, you can't vary the terms of, uh, of an existing shareholder simply because a new investment is coming. So we've typically seen that, uh, you know, this becomes extremely important. Otherwise, you know, your liquidation preference, et cetera, rights, are, you know, it, 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 they may not be strictly enforceable the way you envisaged in the, uh, you know, in the beginning. So, uh, so to pass a res class resolution sometimes becomes extremely essential. Um, so, uh, you know, there could be, uh, you know, if in case there's a preferential issue happening, uh, then there could be something in the articles or in the existing shareholders agreement which grants the, you know, preemptive rights to the existing shareholders, those needs to be waived. The MOA, et cetera, you know, needs to be changed uh, with respect to reclassification of shares. The articles may need to be amended for the new shareholders agreement. The existing shareholders agreement may, may be required to be terminated. Uh, you know, there would be obviously, uh, you know, indemnities and reps and warranties and investor director, et cetera, would come on board. So all of those aspects, you know, one considers while there's a private equity investment. Um, so that, that's it. I mean, uh, I actually wanted to, uh, you know, cover not just the, you know, the, the fact that if you're issuing the shares, these are the permissible instruments, this is the pricing guideline, this is the filing. I actually wanted to cover was, uh, you know, when you're actually issuing the instrument, what you actually need to take care is, you know, and other things, you you got to be careful about even passing the class resolution, etc. So thank you very much. Thank you, Manvinder sir, for deliberating on the FEMA. I believe member must have got benefit through this deliberation. Sir, moment. Uh, 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 members, our next guest speaker is CA Sunil Jain, sir. He is here uh, with us. May I request Sunil Jain, sir, please grace the dais, sir, please. Uh, may I request CS Asis Rostov, sir, please come and present a flower bouquet to Jain, sir, and welcome him at this occasion. Uh, may I request Nitin Kumar, please, practicing company secretary, please come and present a flower bouquet to Jain, sir, and welcome him at this occasion. Nitinji, please. Requesting give a big round of hand to Jan, sir. May I request uh, Chairman and RCF ICS side, his CS Ninja Sukla, sir. Please present a memento to Manvinder uh, Sun and respect him at this occasion. Chairman, sir, please present a memento to Manvinder Sun. 